UCLA is a university with unlimited possibilities for students that desire world-class academics and research. Unmatched diversity, incredible cultural and social opportunities, successful alumni and career networking, first-class campus facilities, plus America's top intercollegiate sports teams. Located in Westwood, just a few miles from the Pacific Ocean, UCLA's one square mile campus is surrounded by famous cities such as Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, and Santa Monica. Welcome to UCLA Bruin Talk. I'm Ralph Irvin alongside Javrina Safari. Coming up on today's show, we're going to go inside Poly Pavilion as we look at UCLA men's basketball and UCLA gymnastics. UCLA is having a lot of exciting events. Let's take a look. Donnie Daniels is in his seventh season as an assistant coach as a part of the UCLA men's basketball program. He's considered one of the top recruiters in all of college basketball, and he has been instrumental in UCLA um, putting together top five recruiting classes each of the last two years. Prior to coming to Westwood, he was the head coach at Cal State Fullerton. Coach, thanks for taking the time to join us. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You. Yeah, my pleasure. It's a young team this year here at UCLA, and it's been off to a little bit of a rough start. What does that provide in terms of opportunities for you to coach and teach this year? I think it gives our young kids a great opportunity to learn on the floor as far as learning on practice, so they'll get a lot of experience you know, through that. Uh, what we have to do also is you know, we have to win in, in spite of that. So uh, our guys are working hard. You know, they gave, we gave a great effort in Anaheim. Uh, we have Kansas coming up this week, so I mean, our guy, we have our guys' attention. And the whole thing is not so much, I mean, obviously we want to win while we do this, but they have to learn also. We just want to have great effort every time we go out, and that's what we're striving for. And I imagine that it's not just teaching basketball skills, but it's also teaching how to do things the way that has proven to be very successful for a lot of players who've come through the program in recent years. Oh, no question. I mean, um, you know, we've had a great deal of success since we've been here. We've, we've had nine uh, players drafted in the NBA. And so our, our success you know, speaks for itself. But our guys also, too, they have to learn, you know, what we, we expect of them, the intensity of the games. And they're learning, too. I mean, it's one thing to tell them, but they have to experience to actually get, you know, uh, the full effect. Coach, how do you help them develop as players? Uh, I would say, um, you know, it's, it's on the court and off the court. You know, it's, it's, it's everything. You know, how you conduct yourself off the floor is very important because that's going to translate, you know, how you are as a player and, so, and also how you conduct yourself on the floor as far as you give it your all every single time out and also help you off the floor. So it's a combination of both ways. But, um, you know, we watch film with the players. Uh, we, uh, obviously, we have practice. We have individual workouts with the players that help them, school, help them improve their skill level. So it's a combination of a lot of things that we do. Um, you know, we're around the players a lot, you know, we gotta make, you know, make sure that, you know, they're eating their right, they're eating breakfast and stuff. Cause a lot of times, you know, guys just kind of wake up and go to class and, you know, our, our nutritionist, Becky, she does a great job as far as in giving them information and informing them what, what it's going to take to get ready for that three o'clock practice. So like I said, there's a lot of things that are involved in it and we just try to stay on top of it. Now, a lot of these players you've been recruiting and for years before they came to UCLA. So you've seen a lot of their high points. Do you, can you use that as motivation as you're coaching them up, whether it's in practice or in games, to remind them during tough times that inevitably will come? Yeah, I, I would say this too. Like when they're in high school, they're kind of like the man. They're like the focal point of their high school teams. Here, we're just trying to take 
you know, their skill level, that they, they really you know, have an advanced skill level, and try to mesh that into a team setting. And also, give, also let, allow them to have their individual and creativity on their own, too. So, um, but yeah, we, we remind them what they did in high school, and we also remind them that what we need also here. I mean, here, for, first and foremost, you know, we want to you know, have a great, great defensive uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. We want to have a very unselfish team where everybody passes and touches the ball. And, and with all that, you know, they, they still can't get away from what, why, why we recruited them here. Right. So, I mean, it, it's, like I say, it's, a, you know, it's a, you know, a melting pot of a lot of things. Well, I would imagine that as you talk about the team philosophy and really installing, instilling that, and then you get to a certain game and there's an opportunity for a player to just, everything's there that if this guy explodes, suddenly it's going to be a great game for us. And then you pop in and say, yeah, I remember when you were able to be the guy, tonight's the time to be the guy. Yeah, I mean, and, and we encourage that. Uh, like we had that, you know, in, in the tournament in Anaheim, guys played well, but we didn't play well collectively. You know, mm -hmm. last year we had a... Um, you know, we finished second and we got to the second round of the NCAA tournament. And, but I uh, know Darren Collison, you know, after his four year, Josh Shipp, fifth year, those guys were the seniors and stuff. And their experience, you know, being here and also the individuality really helped us and propelled us for a great year, even last year. When you go out and recruit, what are you looking for in a player? Uh, we look for position first, you know, size, um, you know, if they pass the, you know, the, uh, the eye test. You know, uh, we, we look for uh, athleticism, we look for skill level. Um, you know, we look for, um, you know, hands, um, passing ability, just the certain kind of skill level and basically what our needs are. I mean, like right now we're, uh, you know, we have, uh, we're looking for guards right now, you know, because uh, when we were really good in the past, we, we had great guards and teams have great guards who are very, very good. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for guards always, uh, looking for frontline people because you can't have enough because like, you know, everybody says, well, you have this and you have that, but injuries also take effect too. And so we know we, that's all part of athletics. We know that. And so um, we have to, uh, you know, stay, be conscious of that so we can definitely, uh, you know, address those issues when they, when they come up. Unfortunately, they do come up, so. I'd imagine that you talked about a guy passing the eyeball test. How many times have you gone out to see a player that you've heard about and you see him initially and you're like, there's no way. <laughs> this guy is not the guy I've heard about. And then suddenly this player just shows as soon as he gets on the floor in a, in a game. Right. Oh yeah, this is everything I was thinking of. The one thing that you, you kind of think, a, a guy can go from seven feet to six ten. A guy can go from six eight to uh, you know six six. You know, mm -hmm. he's not that. But like the skill level is always there. If he can shoot it, he can probably shoot it. If he's a great athlete, he's probably a tremendous athlete. If he's a, a very good passer or, or a guy that gets other people the ball, that's what he probably does. So we kind of go into thing like, well, he's probably not six six. He's probably like six four. But then when he starts playing, now mm -hmm. the, the thing is that he's not even six four. He plays seven feet. Right. So you know, a lot of times, it's like not how tall he is, it's how big he plays. And so we, have, we, we look for a lot of that, too. We look for the intangible, like his toughness, high response to his teammates. And we get a lot out of practice, too, because we can really see how, he's, how he uh, accepts coaching, how he mm -hmm. you know, uh, interacts with his teammates. You know, practice is a lot. You know, we, we get a lot more out of practice than actual games. Now, I'm curious about the process because, again, as a person who's really involved with recruiting, you start getting to know these players when they're 14, 15 years old. You go through recruiting them, say you sign them, you coach them at UCLA, and then they advance to the NBA. Are there really high points in that, or is it just kind of a constant growth in terms of how exciting it all is for you? Well, I tell you, I'm, well, when we recruit them and they come here as a freshman, you know, like obviously Kevin Love left after his first year, so it's kind of hard to, you know, and we're, I mean, we're friends, he calls and stuff like that, but like the Darren Collison's of the world, the Ryan Hollins of the world, guys who actually stayed four years, mm -hmm. you know, and, and went through the process. You know, Ryan is really rewarding because I remember when we first got here, he was a sophomore. And then also that turned into the second round draft pick, you know, of, of uh, I think the Bobcats. And now right now he's with the uh, Timberwolves and he's playing very well. And that's really rewarding. When I was at Utah, I had those experiences. And, and that's nice to see, especially when you see him in high school you know, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Oh, he decides to come to your university. Now you have four, three to four years, and now you watch the, the, the maturation, the maturity. Th those are very, very rewarding when well, you see that. I'm wondering, you know, you talk about that, and then I wonder about a, a player like a Bruce Bowen, who you coach right. who's been right. in the NBA for, it seems like, ever. Right. And it's like you can remember back to when he was just just a college kid. I mean, Bruce was very interesting. Um, I still have the picture of the day Bruce signed in my, in, in my office. And um, he, 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 was, he was who he is from the start to the finish. Uh, he, he called me the day he retired. And then, then unfortunately for me, when, when Bruce signed to Cal State Fullerton, 
I left to go to the University of Utah. So I never had a chance to coach Bruce. Okay. So I, I, I recruited him, and uh, he had a very good, uh, he had a very uh, good career at Cal State Fullerton. And then like, he didn't actually make the NBA until like the second, maybe two and a half years out of Fullerton. And then all okay. of a sudden he, he hits it, and um, you know we just had lunch, you know, as, as far as uh, in the uh, this summer. Like, he hadn't retired yet. He had been traded mm -hmm. to Milwaukee, but he hadn't been retired yet. But the funny thing was, you know, I'm looking at him and I'm going. God, we're sitting here at the Ritz Carlton, and here you are. Here's breakfast, and this <laughs> this thing here costs twenty five dollars, and and you got family, and I think it's a, it's unbelievable where he was mm -hmm. to where he is right now. And I will tell you, that is a, a great story. Yeah. It's your seventh season here. What excites you about UCLA? Uh, the, the campus, um, being at UCLA, and what the, all that means for Southern California, uh, basketball wise, it's just a tradition. Uh, uh, what I've been exposed to as far as uh, people here, you know, Coach Wooden, uh, meeting the, some of the great former players that, you know, that I, growing up, I idolized and wanted to be like, and, um, and just see how big, how, how, how big a family this actually is. Um, you know, I, I left a head job to come here, and for the simple fact that, you know, you don't pass up this kind of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, UCLA speaks volumes throughout the world, throughout the country, you know, as far as the game of basketball. It's the most, you know, revered, uh, uh, university and has the, the the number one tradition of all basketball. So I mean, we're trying to you know uphold that and just do the best we can. But I, I'm excited every day I come. <laughs> is the, is that something you try to pass along? And, and I know it's hard because you try to tell recruits, you try to tell their families that yeah, it's it's a family here, but they still think of UCLA as being a basketball institution, a powerhouse, and really it's more of a family atmosphere. Yeah, it, it, it's that, and also too, uh, you know, you have great you have you know you have great academics here. We have great resources here, and um, and no matter where you go throughout the country, I think you know people know the brand. You know, it's like it's UCLA, it's the Bruins, and everyone said, "Oh yeah, when I when I was a kid or when I was young, you know, Joe and John Wooden, I've been a fan, blah blah blah." And so and th and that's nice, you know, mm -hmm. not nice to hear, but um, you know, UCLA is um, it, it it speaks for itself, and I I'm just just proud to be a part of it. Now, besides recruiting. What other areas do you focus on in terms of uh, coaching the players? I, I take the big guys. You know, I have I have the inside players. Um, that's like uh, Reeve Nelson. Um, you know, uh, Jameson Morgan. I had Kevin Love, Ryan Holland. So, and I and I did that when I was at the University of Utah. So, um, you know, I, I've learned under great teachers. I know Co Coach Majerus. You know, Coach Holland. So I've just taken all my experiences and um, and just brought them, brought them with me. And, I, and so far, you know, our guys have had you know pretty good success. Coach Wooden, how has he inspired your coaching? Um, you know, uh, it, Coach Wooden is so much more than just a coach. I mean, like we had, I've had breakfast with him a couple of, maybe three times, and uh, just how, how, how wonderful a person he is. I mean, uh, I remember telling a guy he that he he bid for dinner with Coach Wooden, and he, he paid, I don't know he paid you know, for example, fifteen hundred bucks. And I said, I tell you this, after dinner with that man. You're going to pay more because you're saying this, this is an unbelievable experience. He's so kind. I, the best thing about Coach Wooden, he'll hear the question for the thousandth time. He'll answer it like it was the first time he ever heard it. Mm -hmm. he's, he's unbelievable. And so, uh, it, it, and you know, I just marvel at how he is at 99 years old and how alert he is and, you know, and how kind he is. And, you know, he, he's an unbelievable person. When you, leave, when you leave his presence, you're a better person for it. I mean, he's, he's, he's remarkable. At this point in the season, what do you think fans can expect from the Bruins as we uh, head towards March? I, I would say, you know, a great effort from this young team. I say, uh, and that's what we strive for. I mean, it, we, with the success we've had, it's never about wins and losses. It's about the effort that you put on the floor, and that's all we're really striving for. That, that for our team to give the best effort at you know at the at the maximum level as long as they can, and then what, if, whatever result uh, happens, the results after that. Then that's the, that's the result. But our whole thing is just to give them, you know, a tremendous amount of effort on the floor, understand the game of basketball, respect the game of basketball, and play it at, at a high level. And Coach, thanks for joining us here on UCLA Bruin Talk. Thank oh, my so pleasure. Much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I want to thank UCLA assistant coach Donnie Daniels for joining us here on UCLA Bruin Talk. Coming up, we'll hit the floor and the beam and the vault. We'll talk UCLA gymnastics coming up right here on UCLA Bruin Talk. After these public service announcements. A trophy can be made just about anywhere. But there's one place where champions are made.
UCLA champions meet here. Welcome back to UCLA Bruin Talk. Coming up, we're going to talk UCLA gymnastics. But first, Javrina has our athlete of the week. This week, we honor Brian Perk of the UCLA men's soccer team as our student athlete of the week. In a rematch of the 2006 NCAA championship game, UCLA walked away with a 2-1 victory over UC Santa Barbara to advance to the NCAA quarterfinals to face Wake Forest. The Bruins come from behind to win, scoring two unanswered goals after the Gauchos scored their first goal in the 11th minute. Although Perk was credited with only two saves, he made several big stops on dangerous balls in the box to thwart the Gaucho attack. Perk's two saves were huge ones. At the 73rd minute, he made a big save on a hard shot, and with 56 seconds left on the clock, UCSB Luis Silva took a shot at the top of the box that skipped between a defender's legs. But Perk had his eyes on the ball, making the save and preserving the Bruin victory. Congratulations, Brian, and good luck to you and the rest of the soccer team. If you would like additional information about UCLA athletics, you can visit us on the web at www.uclabruins.com. Valerie Condos Field is in her 18th season as the head coach of the UCLA Gymnastics Program. She has built one of the nation's finest programs, collecting five national championships, 13 NCAA regional crowns, and 10 Pac-10 titles. Tawny Fatone is a sophomore from Lake Forest, a vault specialist. She is doing vaults that really only a few player or few gymnasts in all the country can execute. We welcome you both to UCLA Bruin Talk. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Coach, in, in the years that you've been here in Westwood, how have you continued to create excellence and success uh, with the gymnastics program? Well, first of all, it's not difficult to recruit great student athletes to UCLA. And I think that being a product of this institution, I graduated in 1987 and I've been coaching since 1982 here. Um, I believe in it. I believe in what UCLA stands for. I believe that. Uh, I love the types of people that come to UCLA, the students and the student athletes, the professors. Um, I just think it's, if you're going to be 18 years old, where else would you want to go to get the experience that you can have, the all-around experience that you have at UCLA? And so when I go out recruiting, I, I could sit and talk about UCLA for hours because I believe in it so much. And like I started by saying, it's not difficult to recruit here. Um, especially if you're performing in a leotard, you want to go somewhere where it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, just, I, th I just have such a passion for what I do. I, I love it. Tawny, you are a vault specialist. Yes. What is your training like? Training is pretty intense. We uh, cover pretty much everything as goes from drills to the actual execution of the skills and um, it varies between each event, so there are some people who train only a couple events, and I myself train all of them. So it's pretty exciting just getting out there and being able to show everybody what you got. Well, and, and you talk about training in terms of the skills. Yes. But that doesn't even come close to all the training you actually have to put in away from the gym in, ter mm -hmm. in terms of working out and fitness. Yes. Yeah, we, um, we meet with our strength and conditioning coach and we do a ton of cardio outside the gym, make sure that we're just thinking smart and being smart about every aspect of it and making sure our mental choreography is there and will be there as yes. season comes. Before they even get to the events mm -hmm. in the, during the day, they'll warm up and do conditioning for a good hour. Yes. I mean, they do a full hour mm -hmm. of strength and conditioning to warm up their muscles to be able to go to the events and not get injured. So that's not even their workout. Right. I would imagine that for, for the athletes, there, there really is never an off season. No. Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it, it, she, she mentioned the recruiting aspect. When you were in high school and being recruited, what, what, what was it that sold you on UCLA? I've actually always wanted to come to UCLA. I would come up to gymnastics meets and watch them, and I was just so excited. and always just thriving to be a UCLA gymnast and so when it actually happened I was overwhelmed and completely overjoyed. Well TV numbers show gymnastics is very popular. I mean as, as a viewable sport it's very popular yet I don't think people realize that when you talk about collegiate gymnastics it is 
of a very high level, not just in terms of the performance, but in the entire evening, is like a normal, real international competition. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one thing that I've always heard people say that when they come to their first collegiate gymnastics meet, they're hooked. Mm -hmm. And we have a larger audience than any other Olympic sport. Um, and I think that the reason why is because the level that you're seeing when you come to Polly Pavilion and see a home meet, the vault that she's going to do is world class. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the floor routine that you're going to see her do is world class. And so um, you can see the best of the best. You don't have to wait for the Olympics to come around every four years to see great gymnastics. You've got it right here in Polly Pavilion. Uh, we have a really exciting event. We've, we've got all the pop and sizzle. We've got all the <laughs> lights. We've got all the, the fog and everything. We do it as we bring a, a, a spectacular mm -hmm. to Poly Pavilion for all of our, our home meets. And uh, it shows. We've got a great following. And, um, you know, every year our numbers get, just get bigger and bigger. So mm -hmm. if, you, if, you want, if you want tickets, you're going to need to sign up because those tickets are going <laughs> <best. laughs> For all that spectacular. After such a successful 2009 season, what is the next step to get to a championship? <laughs> Tony. <laughs> um, next up, would, it definitely started after not making Super 6. I mean, everybody was devastated, but we took that as the start of our new season. And from there on, we had our eyes fixed on nationals this year. So it just takes a ton of training, mental training, making sure everything is just in place and nothing can possibly go wrong. We do a ton of banner squads being prepared for everything that we have to come in season, and it works out. Well, and you, Tani mentioned Super 6. People may not realize the format that goes on with the NCAA championships, which is there are essentially two nights of competition, mm -hmm. and you need to finish high enough in the first night to be able to advance to the final night. And that almost happened but didn't <laughs> quite as, as it went to tiebreakers last year. It went to tiebreakers. Um, I mean, we UCLA and Utah provided a very exciting experience. I wish that we had not provided that <laughs> exciting experience. But um, as you said, 12 teams make it to the first night. Mm -hmm. And so we were in that 12-team bracket. And uh, six teams compete in the morning, in the afternoon. Six teams compete in the evening. We were in the evening. And you have to finish in the top three to move on. And the scoring was really tight. I think between the first place finish and the fourth place finish team was uh, a tenth. Um, and so we tied with Utah. So we went to a tiebreaker. And for the tiebreaker in gymnastics, here we got gymnastics 101. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay. You're ready. <laughs> you compete six student athletes, six athletes per event, and you take the top five scores. So for the tiebreaker, they count all six scores. Well, for the first time in NCAA history, we were tied after the tiebreaker. And none of us knew what the second tiebreaker was. Mm -hmm. I was going to the Utah coach going, what's the second tiebreaker? I was looking at our sports information director going, what's the second tiebreaker? And I guess they dropped the high and the low score. They, they averaged the, the three scores. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so we lost the second tiebreaker by a quarter of a tenth, oh, by 0.025. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> How'd that feel, Tony? Not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, say, I mean, that's not even a lost grip or anything. That's like... That's one of these. Uh, yeah. I that's mean, not that's... even one of those. That's a that, you yeah. know? Yeah. But as Dan Guerrero, our fearless leader, said, um, and I think he's, he's right, and I've proposed this since then, um, it didn't make any sense how the tiebreakers um, determined who was ultimately supposed to go on. Mm -hmm. He said instead, because you have four events, vault, bars, beam, and floor, they should have looked at who won the most events because mm -hmm. that would be a true representation. That kind of follows more of how you're judged all season. And just so happens that we won three of those four events, so we would have moved on. But hindsight is 2020, right? Yeah. And Tawny, you vault special, you, you very good at the vault, three-time mm -hmm. state champion while in high school. Yeah. You also list Mary Lou Retton as one of your idols. Yes. So if you see video of Mary Lou Retton, do you, can you tell when you see her in the 84 Olympics that it's the exact same building that you compete in for all of your home meets? It's definitely, it looks a little bit different, but it's completely and utterly exciting just being able to be in the same environment and get to experience the same thing that she did. And 
it just there's nothing that can describe how amazing it is. It's it's one of those things that people don't realize that Polly Pavilion was the host for Olympic mm -hmm. gymnastics uh, 25 years ago. And I would imagine that that's something that you also sell to recruits. I mean, there's everything about UCLA and LA, but there's also a really poignant piece of gymnastics history. There's a really poignant piece, and unfortunately, the, the, it's getting to be a little bit later now with the recruits that we're bringing in now. They're like, who? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, they weren't even born at that point. But it's really cool, as Tani said, she's running down the exact same sideline of Polly Pavilion that Mary Lou Retton ran. And um, we have another student athlete on our team, Anna Lee, who's a senior. Both of her parents competed mm -hmm. for China in the 84 games, and they both medaled. Mm -hmm. And when I was bringing Anna Lee on campus for her official visit, her mother got teary-eyed as we walked past Polly. And I, and I didn't realize that. I said, are you okay? And she said, the last time I was on this campus, her father and I were meddling in that arena. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, and it's an amazing place. And I don't think, we talk about this when, when we're in the locker room all the time, mm -hmm. that they feel the magic of Polly. Mm -hmm. They talk about Absolutely. it a lot. Wow. It's not just gymnastics. It's a Coach Wooden. Okay. It's, it's volleyball. It's everything that, that UCLA is. Yeah, is in there. <clears throat> I'm curious, and I know a lot of people are curious. Who designs your leotards? <laughs> Tani? Miss <laughs> um, Val actually looks through and... Um, all the time, like the awards are going on and everything, and picks out kind of designs that she the Oscars. likes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the Oscars to be exact. <laughs> picks the <laughs> magazine to be exact. Um, picks out um, designs in different um, styles that she likes and sends that to our design or our leotard uh, designer. And Candy Dengrove. <laughs> but what's really cool is Candy works very closely with the student athletes. She'll mm -hmm. bring the leotards in. And we get to try them on, and she makes alterations if you need it a little bit longer because we have a longer torso. Or... Right. Mm -hmm. um, but each leotard costs around three to four hundred dollars to make. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then other people <laughs> want other like younger gymnasts want to buy our leotards, and mm -hmm. there's no way that she could duplicate our mm -hmm. leotards. So she makes like a simplified brand to sell to the public. Now, after five national championships, 10 Pac-10 titles, what is left to accomplish? Or is there anything that you worry about in terms of goals and it's more just about helping uh, your student athletes grow? Uh, no, no, no. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Student athletes, that is my overall goal, right? Yes, Quality of life yes. and life lessons through exactly. the sport of gymnastics. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you're going to be in the gym and we're going to be in there, we're going to leave it all on the floor every day and I'm not retiring until we've won 10. Sounds good to me. Exactly. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you so Our much. Pleasure. Thank you. We want to thank uh, Tani Fatone and Valerie Condos Field for joining us here in UCLA Bruin Talk. Also want to thank Donnie Daniels for joining us earlier in today's show and thank you for joining us as well. For Javrina Safrai, I'm Ralph Irvin. This has been UCLA Bruin Talk, your inside look at UCLA Athletics.